If you're just joining us, as I said earlier, we're on the uh, back end. We're on the last Sunday of our series on the core values of our church. And I I think it's appropriate one more time to say, hey, why would you even do a series about core values? Why would you do that? Well, it's because that we have... um, We have a clear picture as a local body of Christ about who we are, why we exist, so that you have good uh, language. When somebody says, hey, why do you go to church? Like there's a billion answers, right? And and, and at least a half billion of them are good. Um, (laughs) But but at least you, you, you have some definitions by which to say, hey, this is why I go to church. Right, because if, if we if we keep falling the line, right, we talk about uh, joy, unity, mission, sacrifice, and these core values are rooted not in an idea but in a person, Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the most joyous, uh, that the the Trinity is the most unified, that that this God, this triune God, is the most missional and most sacrificial seen through the person of Jesus Christ. Like this is this is who this is a piece of who He is. And so we're able to say, well, man, why do you go to church? I mean, you know, the, the, the trump card answer is Jesus, right? I go to church because of Jesus. Uh, but the world needs to know more than just the name, right? They need to know what's, what's in the name, what's behind the name, what's, what makes him so different and special. And the, the reality that he is the perfect perfection of everything good is truth that should just make our hearts well up with excitement about who he is and what he's done. And we say, man, I go to church because Jesus is this joyous God who loves me so much he died for me. And he's on pursuit to come redeem his children. He wants to bring us home and dwell together in unity with him, even as he himself is the triune God. Right? Just gives us language to help us out. And we know what we're saying and we know it's true according to the to the scriptures. And so today's today's message then is Really, sort of a, a summation of them. That basically, you can take these two uh, these two core values, and you can say, "Well, this is this is sort of the essence of authentic community, right? To be really, really happy dwelling together. We're an authentic community around the the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel that we've been transformed by Christ. You're actually saved and converted, and that we are we rest in the revelation of His Word to know who He is and to know uh, to, to learn of His faithfulness and His goodness." And because of that, we have, uh, by, by grace, through faith in Christ, we dwell together in unity. We're accountable uh, to who Christ is and what he commands us to do and be. Um, and then because of that, with, with, with believing in him in our own hearts and being accountable collectively, then we have this real authentic community and to dwell together in authentic community. And then, and then this side, you can sort of summarize this by just saying, hey, we're on an ambitious mission, that Christ, in fact, is on an ambitious mission. That he desires all men be saved. He wants to gather everyone. That he is the great shepherd. His sheep hear his voice. He doesn't lose one of them. So ambitious is the king of kings and lord of lords that he would take on flesh and dwell among us. To reveal himself to us. So that we would be sure about who the one true living God is. Would die for us. Rise again for us. Yeah, not for the best things about ourselves, but for the very worst things about ourselves. This is why he's dying. We haven't earned his death. We don't deserve him dying for us. He graciously gives us that. He is, he is determined to tell us there is no other God but him who loves us and cares for us and saves us. So if he's sure to do those things, then he is sure to bring us home. He is the God of authentic community who is on an ambitious mission. Why do you go to church? Man, I want to be a part of an authentic community. Why do you go to church? I want to be on an ambitious mission with my life. Why do you go to church? I mean, there's, there's lots of communities that try to be authentic and ambitious. Yeah, but there's only one God. There's only one God who's really authentic and really, truly ambitious. The rest falter. But there's this one God. His name's Jesus. Can I tell you about him? That's why I go to church. And we've got to know why we go to church. Otherwise, we're just doing stuff, right? Otherwise, we, we, can, we can grow cro- crochet stuff or, or play croquet for that fact, right? We can be a part of those groups. But that's not what the Lord's calling us to. He's calling us to dwell together in, in good unity and be on mission for him. Yeah. So let me just keep talking about it for a while, can I? Can I just keep telling you about it for just a little bit? See, because in, our, in the idea of authentic community, our authenticity as a church, is directly tied to the reality of our God, Jesus Christ. He is the most joyous being to ever exist. 
Hebrews 1 teaches us that God the Father has anointed God the Son with the oil of gladness beyond all of his companions. Hebrews 5.9 says that he is the source of salvation for all who believe. This is where our joy comes from. Hosea 11 tells us that the Lord's compassion is aroused and his heart is changed within him at the sight of his children. Zephaniah 3 says that he rejoices, that God rejoices over us with singing. Matthew 11 says that his yoke is easy, that his burden is light, and in him there is real, true rest for our souls. And by grace, through faith, we get to receive Jesus Christ, we get to experience Jesus Christ, and we get to display all that Jesus Christ is to the world by being the most joyful people. See, our authenticity will be revealed in our response of joy to God. Let me say it one more time. Our authenticity as a community, as a church, will be revealed in our response of joy to our God. Let me me see if I can express this some way in, in personal story. In, in, in the description of, of, of my or my wife and I's, our family's last month, and some of that has to do with the church itself. This is what our last month has looked like. We've been talking about it a little bit, and, and it just seems to make sense to talk about this in the, in the context of responding with joy. So four Sundays ago, our church finished a two-year process of constitutional change. Uh, Some of that unity, this authentic community, was displayed over the course of these years as over 80% of our church voted for the new church covenant. That the revision to membership was unanimously changed by voice vote. And that 80% voted on our new ecclesiology, our new church policy. That was four weeks ago. If you've been around, it feels about like four and a half years ago. But, But nonetheless, it was four weeks ago. Uh, It was a day to rejoice in the Lord's faithfulness through the process. Two days later, our sister Ilga Friedenfeld went to be home with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just two days later. No no suspicions of, no, no, no ongoing real sickness. She just went to be with the Lord. On the following Saturday, we memorialized her. And when that got done, when that service was over and the Sweet Time Fellowship happened, I went and picked up the A-team, our missionaries to, to East Asia. I went and picked them up, six of them, two adults, four children, under eight, ten of us living in my house for eight days. Yeah, yeah, you're all thinking it. You don't want to say it, right, because you don't want to be rude or ugly. And that's, that's good. That's good maturity. I'm very proud of you. But it's a little crazy, a little crazy, right? But, but it really was a joy. It was fun. We love the A-team. They love us. It was a good time. We had all kinds of stuff. Uh, they, they landed on that Saturday. were with us uh, on that Friday. My wife flew out Friday morning to see her mom, who has been dealing with cancer. That Friday afternoon, Samantha Stewart, one of our former interns, she flew in to hang out with us and the A-team. Autumn flew back the next day in order to be around just the family, the church, and the people. Then she flew back, and when she flew back, she was able to tell me good news about her mother's uh, success in treatment with the battle against cancer. But she also had to tell me the very bad news of a six-year-old boy in our son's junior kindergarten class who passed away. The, 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 that, that Sunday, the very next day, was a glorious service on missions. If you were here for Adam's sermon, and everybody will tell you that it was just a really unique, powerful Sunday. Like everybody I talked to, they're like, yeah, just the Lord's presence was just here. It was great Sunday. And I immediately left that, my wife and I, and went to a prayer time at Veritas for the family and for the teachers. The Monday began at 4 a.m. run to the airport with the A-team and Samantha Stewart, followed by returning back to Veritas to talk to the 7th and 8th graders about the kid who had just passed away. Tuesday and Wednesday were normal. Thursday was chapel at the school to memorialize young Samuel. 
Saturday was the funeral for Samuel, followed by my own son's birthday party in the afternoon, followed by a dinner for Veritas that night. Just a scheduled event. That's a month, right? Church, community, small group leaders meetings, works, kids, dinner, community groups, basketball, church officers, prayer, future planning, date night, sermon writing. It's crazy. And I'm not looking for pity. Because I know that any of you could stand up here and rattle off your last month and we'd all be like, whoa, I'm glad I'm not you. <laughs> we would all be like, hey, amen, I feel you, it's tough. But in the midst of all that crazy, what, what is going to make us different in the, than the rest of the world? Because your friends without Jesus experience the same crazy. They experience the same ups and downs, the same roller coaster of emotions, and having to be in some ways responsible, right? You have to continue to live life. You can't just stop. How are we going to be different? Where is Christ in that? Here it is. Our response, the way we're going to be different is our response of joy to the Lord. Not circumstantial happiness. Not delusional dismissal of reality. Not the sola bootstraps of positive thinking. But rather real, Christ-centered, gospel-grounded, faith-infused, spirit-carrying joy that walks us through all of that and more. It can be experienced most clearly. This joy. Because you're saying, okay, well, how do I have that joy in the midst of all that stuff? How, how does that happen? You can experience it most clearly through the word of God and the people of God. Again, let me apply that really clearly just in the context of the story that I just share with you. To the changes in the Constitution, I rejoice in the God of Gideon. Because he's the one who gets all the glory for any of it. To the loss of Ilga, I pray as the Lord taught through Paul to the church at Thessalonica that I do not mourn as those who have no hope. With the A team, I rejoice with the psalmist that I both remember and anticipate the faithfulness of the Lord to shout for joy as he preached in Psalm 126. With the loss of Samuel, I follow the example of David in 2 Samuel 12, where he also loses a newborn son, and there's great weeping, but there's also a great faith that he would go to be where his son was. No matter how great this life might get, not unlike my date night with my wife this past Friday, because it was stellar. I can rejoice in the Lord first as Luke 10 tells me that I'm to be more happy that my name is written in heaven than anything else. And no matter how terrible this life gets, my wailing and my anger concludes as Psalm 11 teaches me, I ought to trust in the Lord's unfailing love. That when I feel like the Lord has rejected me, removed himself from me, and I, and I cry out, how long, O oh Lord, how long must I wait? I, I rather, I respond ultimately by saying, I trust in the Lord's unfailing love. Rejoice in the salvation. And I sing because he has dealt bountifully with me. As Job himself rightly accounted, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. The word of God sustains us and brings us joy. And the people of God, will the people of God just keep reminding us to go back to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords through his word? In all of this past month, not once did I ever have to be alone. I have a loving wife who is by my side. I got a good brother, George, who's telling me just to trust when my trust fails. I've got an unbelievable staff that just keeps doing their job and keep faithfully just encouraging and praying. 
all, all, even all the nominations that we've received from people and been accepted by people is encouraging as the body of Christ is saying, yes, we're going to serve the Lord in this local congregation. It's been a reminder that we are in this together. And the scripture says the world will know us by this kind of love, by this kind of faithfulness in the most intimate relationship, in the most communal of relationships, that this is how the world knows. Man, we are a joyful people because we are loved by God and we love each other. This is our authenticity. This is our, this is where it's supposed to be. And so not only is our authenticity directly tied to the reality of God, but our community then is tied directly to our God, Jesus Christ, because he is the most unified being to ever exist. The scriptures teach us that, that, the, Father, that the Father is God in Philippians 1, that Jesus himself is God, Titus 2, that the Spirit is also God, Acts 5, 3 and 4. So we worship, according to the scriptures, one God in Trinity, in, in a triunity. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, as expressed in the Athanasian Creed of 500 A.D. Matt Perriman, in his article on the Trinity, writes, The doctrine of the Trinity means that there is one God who eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Stated differently, God is one in essence and three in person. These definitions express three critical truths. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. Each person is fully God and that there is only one God. So we, art, we articulate the Almighty God revealed in Scripture as one essence and existing in three persons. Uh, there, there is no other religion in the world that would profess this. There's only one God. There's only one Trinity. And our community then will be a witness in, in, in our response to our world. I've been reading a series of articles by a guy named Trevin Wax, and I want to try to articulate and, and, and summarize in the best that I can to you this morning. And basically, it's, it's, it's articles about expressive individualism and, and how the church can respond to it. Expressive individualism can be sort of found in the context of, um, of colloquial phrases that you hear, like, be true to yourself, follow your heart. Hey, you, you be you. You, you do you, right? Th these popular statements reveal the, the philosophy of the day. Um, it's not new. It may be exacerbated, maybe going in a direction, but it's not new. Both, both Alec de Tocqueville and, and then Walt Whitman in the 1800s penned prose and poetry about the self as a great good. But expressive individualism is the new term we use that builds on the individualism of two centuries ago to right now. Uh, one guy, a guy named Yuval Levin, who is the president of Ethics and Public Policy Center, writes, the term expressive individualism not only uh, suggests not only a desire to pursue one's own path, but also a yearning of fulfillment through the definition and articulation of one's own identity. The capacity of the individual to define the terms of their own existence by defining their personal identities is e increasingly equated with liberty with the meaning of some basic rights, and it, is, and it is given pride of place in our self-understanding. So in our culture, being authentic has less and less to do with being like the opposite of hypocritical, and more and more to do with not conforming to history or traditions or authority. Right? So the, the, the definition is sort of being turned. Authentic, real, hi hypocrisy, lie. But now it's authentic is your own self-identity 
as juxtaposed to authority or as opposed to conformity. Uh, Catholic philosopher Charles Taylor writes, I mean the understanding of life which emerges with the romantic expressivism of the late 18th century that each one of us has their own way of realizing our humanity and that it is important to find and live out one's own as against surrendering to conformity with a model imposed on us from the outside by society or the previous generation or religious or political authority. Do you hear that this morning? The idea is that we should realize our own humanity without surrendering to conformity with a model imposed on us from the outside. We determine it. When you live in a world where there is no creator, where humans are inherently good. When you live in a world where the ideology is that we are progressing or evolving to our best selves yet, helped along by the technology that we are creating, then each individual's autonomy becomes the highest good. Until it runs afoul of someone else's autonomy. And then you're in trouble. And then you need some different questions and answers. What I mean is that individual autonomy somewhere runs into another and possibly greater authority. If you keep this up, then isolation from the rest of the world will increase in the individual's life. If you don't think that I'm, I'm speaking something that's a reality right now, then just ask yourself this question. Why does the United Kingdom have an appointed minister of loneliness? They have one. That's a job. Great Britain has a minister of loneliness. Because people are growing in isolation because they are self-autonomous. They get to choose. And when this happens, when we get to the place for a minister of loneliness or we get to the place of crazy anarchy, I don't mean to paint such a crazy picture. I mean, the the pendulum swings, right? And and events happen that change the course of thought and time. And, And as we learned in Sunday school this morning, The divine God is over all of it. We're not just out here spinning in some sort of crazy pool. The Lord Jesus knows what's going on, and he's over it. And we'll be in it and through it till he comes back and transforms it to conform to what he says is good and right. But until that day, what do we do? I'll tell you what we should do. We should be the authentic community of the church. We should be the real church. Not the made-up church, not the programmatic church, but the loving church. The, 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 the dig-in-deep church. The willing-to-go-the-extra-mile church. The church has the answers for our culture in our day. The church not only embraces, but literally surrenders to and literally worships a higher authority. The, the true church of Christ, right, the, real, the one universal truth of Christ has zero problem with an authority over themselves. In fact, we take delight, if we understand it rightly, we take delight in it. We, we actually, because the real church of Christ doesn't think that we are inherently good, The true church of Christ is following the scriptures and we know that we are inherently bad. Bad enough to deserve hell and punishment. We don't don't joyfully, blissfully, you know, sing beer songs about it. That'd be a mistake. We should mourn it to a degree, but we're happy to confess it. Because we know what's on the other side of the confession. 
The true church of God knows what's on the other side because to say I'm inherently bad, deserving of death, that's a heavy statement. Not many want to hear it. Not many can hear it. But for the Christian, for the follower of Christ, we already know it. We can say it freely because we know it's on the other side. It's Jesus. We're happy. We're happy people that we don't define ultimate authority in ourselves. We, we are happy that we actually surrender ourselves to an ultimate authority, an ultimate authority who loved us so much that he would die on a cross to save us from ourselves. That's, we're happy about that. This is an answer for the world. And, we, and we've studied Matthew and Mark from this pulpit over the last five years. And we already know from the Gospels that the world doesn't always want to hear that message. But it's still the right message. Our community, this church, is founded on this reality. Thus, as our culture, our, our westernized culture becomes more individualistic and isolated, we as a church are able to invite them to look first at God instead of their feelings to know their identities. To trust that their identities are most truly seen as sons and daughters of God. And then they can become a part of a people who lay down their lives for the greatest good. Not a what, but a who. Jesus Christ. And listen, you don't have to go. You, you're around all these people every day. In your workplaces, uh, in, 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 in school communities, and wherever, wherever you dwell, those people around you, because people who don't know Jesus are always all around. And you don't have to go to them with your, with your philosophical cultural handbook and say, I'd, I'd like to show you graph two and three as to why you're thinking wrongly. In fact, please don't do that. Or at least, at least don't tell me you're part of this church and do that, all right? Don't do that. What you do is you say, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. Hey, hey, why don't I go to, I go to this group of friends from my church every Wednesday night. Why don't you come hang out with us? Hey, I, I go to a rich Sunday school class on Sunday morning. Why don't you come? Hey, I, I go to this church. Pastor's a little goofy, but he's still pretty clear. Why don't you come? And all of a sudden, people, the, the idea of the authentic community is that people actually experience what you know is true. They taste and see that the Lord is good because you and I are the hands and feet of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is an authentic community. you got to be excited about this. If not, you got to check your spiritual pulse. And, and because of that, I'm able to, to freely just ask you, give yourself to it. Give yourself to it more than you ever have. Not, not give yourself to me. I mean, I'm good for the 20 years. Body's going to run out and be Jesus. Made no difference. 10 years after that, you don't remember who I am. Literally. Literally. That's true. I'm not asking you to give yourself to this building. I'm asking you to give yourself to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself up for you. And to express that in the context of an authentic community that reflects the triunity of this God that saved you. If that's not a vision you can't get behind, I don't have anything for you. I've got nothing else to say. I don't have anything better. I can talk to you about the Red Sox and the Patriots. I can tell you about the cultural beauty, beauty of the city of Boston. But I don't have anything better to actually offer you than Jesus Christ. And the authentic community found in the local body of the church and the universal body that will be in heaven for all people, all places, and all times. Follow Jesus. And if we're going to love God that way and love others that way, then we ought to be on this ambitious mission for Christ. Because he's on an ambitious, on ambitious mission. Because am, our, ambition can have a negative connotation to it, but it, it should and could have a positive connotation. It's not wrong to be ambitious. It's just wrong to be ambitious for the wrong things or for the wrong motivations. But ambition for, the, for, the, for a right thing and a good thing is wonderful. The people you admire the most are the people who gave themselves for something worthy of the cause. 
You can think about that later over lunch. Talk about that. That's a good question for lunchtime. Who's the, you know, who's the person that you really admire? What do they give themselves to? You'll, and you'll find, oh, they did. They gave themselves. Our ambition is directly tied to the reality of our God. Is God ambitious? Yes. Properly defined, even by human, circumstance, uh, human standards, Webster, the, des- it's, the ambition is the desire to achieve a particular end. What's the Lord's particular end? For his glory to resound in all the nations. Revelation, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, particular end, read the book of Revelation. There's a bunch of it that won't make any sense of it to you, probably. But you're going to get, you're going you're to read those first three chapters and be like, yeah, this is a great book. And then four through 18 are going to mess you up a little bit. Right? You'd be like, what is this? And you can call me and we'll have coffee together and I will reveal to you how much I don't know about Revelation, um, but I'll keep pointing you back to Jesus. But when you get to 18 and 19 and 20 and 21, it'll begin to make sense again to you. It just speaks a little more plainly. It's all good. And if you take your time to study it, you can see the truth in all of it. But, but it's, the, it's those scenes actually that are interspersed throughout the entire book of Revelation, where all the people of God are gathered around Jesus on the throne, and they are worshiping his name forever. This is his ambitious mission. Pastor, it seems a little megalomaniac to me. No, it's not selfish if, in fact, you are the perfect God of the universe. It's saving. Not selfish. It's saving because without him on the throne, you and I are in huge, huge trouble. There is no forgiveness for sin if he's not on the throne. We perish without him. His his great ambition is to bring salvation to his children, which brings glory to his name. His glory resounds in all the nations, but his glory also resounds in your life. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus getting ready to go to the cross. And he says, Father, if there's any other way, this can shake out. That's J translation, not in the Greek. If there's any other way this can go down, if anything can happen other than what's about to happen, then please let it be this way. And then he prays, not my will, but yours. And this is how God's ambitious mission resounds to the world. is when you and I say, it's not my will. My identity is not my own. Our ambition will be revealed in our response to God. And our response to God is to do what he does, and that's to go. He went, he left heaven and came to earth. You should leave your home and go to work. You should leave your vacation and go to, to Austria. You should, you know, you should, you should go. Uh, in J.D. Greer's book, Gaining by Losing, he gives three metaphors for the church. That, that The first two aren't uncommon. The first is a cruise liner, right, where Christian luxuries for the, or, for the whole family can be attained. There's programs for... For, for singles and for children and for senior adults and for young marrieds and middle marrieds and older marrieds and don't want to be married and everything else. And the role of the member then is to pay the pastors and staff to find the targets which was to be aiming at and fire the, you know, the, you know oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong metaphor. It, it, the, the church, uh, uh, this, this church, the cruise liner, all these things, this church is to meet my expectations. The church is to meet my felt needs. And as long as my felt needs are met, I'll keep coming back. When when the church isn't meeting my needs, I'll go someplace else or do something else. That's what the cruise liner church looks like. There's also the, the the metaphor of the battleship church. This is the institution of the church that does most of the fighting, right? The role of the member is to pay the pastors and staff to find the targets and fire the guns each week as the congregation gathers and watch what happens. Uh, st- still the battle, right? But just the, the, we'll just send out the, 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 you know, the, the, the paid ones or the called ones or people who are really skilled at those things or whatever the case may be, and we'll just, we'll just applaud them and whatever. But the, but the third metaphor for the church that J.D. Greer applies is, that, is the church that's the aircraft carrier. 
I never heard this until I read the excerpt. But, it's, but you're still engaged in the battle. right? The church is engaged in the battle, but they're engaged by equipping and sending out the members of the church to the battlefront. So if you've been shot at and you're smoking and you're, all your gauges are spinning around and around, you can land at the ship. You can get healed. You can get fixed. Uh, fixed. Be careful with it. But, you know, you can, you can get restoration. You can get, you know, you can get healing, encouragement. And then you can be sent back out off the flight deck to go back out into the battlefield and do that which God's called you to do. I think this is a, a really good metaphor. I mean, there's, there's, there's some other good metaphors too, but this is, this is a good one. Not the cruise liner. Where we're all just enjoying it and just as long as our, our needs are met. Not the battleship where just, you know, we're all in the same ship, but only the, only the vocation to do it. But, but the aircraft carrier where we're sent out. So my question to you this morning is, is if, if, if that metaphor rings true to you, then what's the next step in your being equipped to get off the flight deck? To carry the gospel to your neighbor, to, to your nation, to, to the world? Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Maybe this is your next step. Maybe today's the day that you, that you realize, man, my whole life is just sort of centered around what I do. But I need my life to center around who Christ is and what he's called me to do. Because that, that ambition, right, is directly tied to God to be sent out. But our mission is also directly tied to the reality of our God. See, in order for God's mission to be fulfilled, Christ has to be, he has to be two things. He has to be perfectly God and perfectly man. He has to be. In being perfectly God, he satisfies all the righteous requirements in order to bring salvation to a lost and dying world. If he's anything less than God, then Jesus' death cannot overcome death and sin and hell, the punishment of death. In being perfectly human, he is able to be the true sacrifice for all humanity. If he's anything less than human, then his death cannot enter into our sin because he's not a genuine sacrifice. So in order for God's mission to be fulfilled, Christ has to do two things. He has to, he has to be two things and do two things. He has to be fully God, fully man. And he has to do two things. He has to die and rise again. Because in his death, we know that our sins are forgiven because he's the ultimate sacrifice. The Old Testament points to time after time after time. But in his resurrection, we know that our hope is for the realest form of living ever. Our mission then, our mission, our ambitious mission will be revealed in our response to God. We talk about it in terms of life and resources and glory. Are we sacrificing our lives in response to God's sacrifice of life for our lives? This is what Paul writes in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Jesus Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I know, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Do you need a purpose statement for your life? If you haven't picked one out yet, that's a pretty good one. Wake up every morning and before you think about your email account or who won the game or, or what's next or grabbing the kid who's screaming in the, in the what, what is that thing called? The crib, that's what it's called. If you wake up and your first thought is I'm crucified with Christ, I don't live. Christ lives in me and the life I live today, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Then put your feet to the floor and go.
Get the kids, start your coffee, look at the email, whatever, but, but say, Lord Jesus, today my life is yours and yours alone. Just for this day, because you're not promising me tomorrow. I don't know. Well, it's on my calendar. I'm not guaranteed that's to come, but I'm guaranteed that you, you will take care of me. Are we sacrificing our resources in response to God's sacrifice of resources? Because Christ has given us heaven. He gave us an inheritance that never perishes, spoils, or fades. Your bank accounts, your homes and cars are nothing more than several, several things, but nothing more really than not only tools to be used for his kingdom, but reminders of a provision that's far greater than what you own. And you don't have to be rich to be selfish. And you don't have to be poor to be humble. It doesn't make a difference what's actually in your bank account because you can be greedy as can be with three cents. But what matters is, man, what I do have is from the Lord and is the Lord's, and I will use it for him. Do you know that we are a big little church? Do you know this? Our budget is predominantly payroll and building. If you look at, you look at our budget, it's not a secret. You can guess, members, whoever, you can go find it. It's not hard. But it's predominantly payroll and building. Very few churches our size have the children's programming, the internships, the summer programming, missions opportunities, community groups, and the quality of the arts and communication that you witness. Very few churches our size have what we have. Do you know why that's true in part? It's in part because you're sacrificing. It's because you're volunteering to make those things happen. It's because you're giving in order to help pay salaries. Praise be to God for your generosity. Praise be to God where he has revealed to you that what you have is not your own. And to give it for the sake of Christ is an easy gift. Again, ask the Lord what, what your next step is. And ask the Lord what our next steps are as a community, as a church. As to what we ought to do with our time and our money and our talents. Are you sacrificing your glory? I've tied this a lot over the course of the years that I've preached this sermon series, basically to your reputation. Right? By sacrificing your glory, you, you don't care what people think about you personally in that sense, but you care much what they think about Jesus in the context of your life. Are you willing to be chastised for it? Are you willing to speak boldly and plainly, lovingly, compassionately, wisely, but nonetheless boldly and plainly to tell the truth in love regardless of what people say about you, what they'll accuse you of? Let me give you an example. of it. Do you know who Henry Dunster is? That's the trivia for today. If you know who Henry Dunster is, you are good at New England history. He's the first president of Harvard. Uh, he actually sacrificed his homeland of England because he was fleeing to America amidst religious persecution in his country. He sacrificed his own personal life, as in the 14 years of his presidency, he never received a full annual salary. He, they, they signed a contract, that he never, he never got it. He got part of it, didn't get all of it. In fact, he borrowed against his own personal credit for the sake of the school, so the school could have more. And he operated New England's first printing press in order to provide for his own personal family. So he's pulling a salary from the school, giving whatever percentage back to the school to keep the school going while operating this printing press so his family has what his family needs. He sacrifices. He sacrificed for his family, a family where he married a widow with children and had more children of his own. But his most impressive sacrifice to me, in my, in my estimation, and what I, I hope you see it the same way, when it, when it came to a time where Puritan authorities actually whipped Minister Obadiah Holmes for his, wait for it, Baptist views. Dunster, and, and by that meaning, just whether it's believer's baptism or infant baptism, but he but, but uh, Minister Holmes, Obadiah Holmes, felt like believer's baptism was the way and was whipped for it by other religious brothers in the Christ. 
So Dunster went and studied the scriptures on his own, and he concluded that the Baptists were right. I mean, if he didn't, I would even use the story, right? Just kidding. So in 1653, Dunster refuses to have his newborn son baptized. Now, he could have held his tongue to stay at Harvard. But as he itinerantly preached in, pe- in places around New England and around Harvard, he, he knew he needed to preach the Word of God for what the Word of God said. Thus, in one of his usual pulpit supplies, he took up the topic of baptism and he preached the Word for what it said. As he was best convicted, And Harvard's overseers voted that no one of such unsound faith should be allowed to continue in a teaching office. And he lost his job as president of Harvard. The glory of institutional position and man's approval paled in comparison to the glory of Christ and his word for Professor Dunster. How about you? Are you ready? Is the Lord equipping you to stand up and sacrifice your glory for his? If you're not, then ask the Lord to get you ready for an ambitious mission of sacrificing your glory. Ask him to get you ready. Because the day is coming where his glory reigns in full. It reigns right now. He's in control of it, but there will be a day, right, as Philippians 2 teaches us. This day right here, that you ought to have this mind among yourselves, amongst the community of believers, not just every individual, but of yourselves. Have this in mind, that which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, an ambitious mission. Therefore, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of, say it, church, Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the fulfillment of the ambitious mission. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to sacrifice If we, if we can just aim, if we can just aim to be a church that looks like this, we, we will see the Lord move in mighty ways. And if we are content to just let it go along as it goes along, if we are content to not anchor ourselves to the word, if we are content to, to just let somebody else do it, we will not see near as much Of the mightiness of Christ. Because the eyes of the Lord look to and fro about the earth. Looking to strengthen those who he finds fully committed to him. Are we there? We're not totally there. But are we on our way? Are we believing these things? Is it it, it driving us? Man, I pray to God it does in days to come. I I believe it has been in some ways over the last few years. But I pray more and more we just sort of sink. Our, our local church identity, we're not, we're not better than, than TCC or Westgate or Banner Hill or Milestone or, or, or Crossroads or anybody else you can think. We're not better than. That's not the point. That's vain ambition. That's selfish ambition. We want to be on the God's ambitious mission by being this authentic community.